Today our main topic will be uh, BioPython, and specifically we will cover how to use it to process uh, biological sequences and annotations. Uh, but as usual, before we begin with the main topic, uh, let us start with a small digression, uh, which is related to the student presentation about the bonus question uh, that you heard on generators and iterators. And that would be how to handle big data, uh, which is also related to today's theme, because as we will see, this is very much embedded into the design of this library that we are going to learn of, of BioPython. So like Yoshua said, it's not a common in, in biology that we need to process very large uh, data files. And very often it will be the case. And in fact, I think uh, you're going to encounter that uh, uh, this week in the upcoming exercises. We're going to start processing data that I suspect for most of you, it will not even fit into your uh, memory <laughs> unless you have an incredibly powerful uh, computer with tons of memory. Uh, that will be the case, and, and that it's not very uncommon. It's very usual that we need to deal with very large data files that won't fit into memory. And like Yoshua said, that's the reason why we need this whole design pattern of generators and iterators, and we need to work in a memory efficient way. Instead of loading everything to memory like we did up until now, we will have to work on the data in chunks and each time process a new piece of data. So we saw that generators can be used to do that. And as we will see, BioPython indeed implements this generator concept. But this, this is even more general than that. And Python allows us to do that in, actually, when we, every time that we work with a file, we can do it in, in a lazy and memory efficient way. Uh, so again, up until now, mostly what we saw when we worked with files we just open the file, getting this file handler object. And then we use the read function to read its entire content into memory and we close the file. And then we worked with the content of the file. And that worked because we worked with relatively small files. Uh, we also saw that we can use a file as some kind of an iterator. Now you have the word uh, and you know what it means. And we saw that we can iterate it through say a for loop and each time we iterate over it, we get the next line in the file. So if we want to process it one line at a time, we can do it that way. And that way is also memory efficient because it doesn't load every, uh, the entire content of the file into memory. Instead, every time that the for loop takes the next element, it will take just one line, read it from the storage. Then you can process it. And then you will only get the next line when you get to the first iteration of the, of the for loop. And this will be memory efficient. It turns out you can also use uh, files to access any, any random place. So it basically allows you what is called random access. And that is using the seek function uh, that you see here, some code example. So essentially what the seek does, it changes the location of where the file currently reads into some random location that you specify. And then the next time in the, when you call the read function, it will start calling reading from this, loca this location. And if you give a number to the read function, it will also limit the number of characters that you get. So for example, in this case, you will get just the 10 characters starting from uh, this position of 10,004. So by the way, what, what this also entails, I also know that some of you were confused about it. There, file handler file, what you get from the open function, uh, this kind of object is what is called a stateful object. It has a state and it knows at each time which location in the file it currently re reads from. So if you call, for example, re the read function without any parameters and you read the entire content, the next time that you call the read function, even if you haven't closed the file, you will get an empty string because it has already exhausted all the content of the file. So, and that's because of this uh, state of the file. It keeps, uh, it keeps track of where it's currently stored. Okay, it's important to understand that this is just a file handler object. The, re the, re the representation in Python of the file, this doesn't really influence the file itself. So if you open a file in reading mode, nothing will happen to the file, but the file handler object that you use in Python, this will have some state and it will keep track of where it's currently reading from. So if you want to read a file again, say, you will have to use the f seek zero to get back to the beginning of the file, and only then you can reread it again. 
Okay. Sorry? You can close and open it. Yeah, you can also close and open it, but it's less efficient. Uh, if you use the seek function, it's simpler. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. So the main format we're going to uh, start working with today, I suppose many of you know that, is called the FASTA format. Which of you have worked in the past with FASTA files? Also, okay, so quite many of you. So the FASTA format is a format that we use to store uh, information of biological sequences. So typically it will be DNA, RNA, and protein. Um, so, so the name FASTA is a bit strange. It's a legacy uh, from some ancient software that people used uh, <laughs> used to use uh, back in 1995, which was called uh, the FAST program. And at the time there was a FAST-P meaning protein and FAST-N for nucleotides. And they used the term FAST-A as a short for FAST-all meaning like any alphabet. Uh, but ever since the software has died out and we're stuck with the name that doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, but that's still the name that people use to this file format. And as we <laughs> okay, so let's see what this file looks like. As you can see, it's very simple. It's very readable, uh, like many of the formats that we work with. So here in black, you can see an example of a FASTA file. And on, on top of that, I put in red just some annotations so to, to explain what we are seeing here. So basically, a FASTA file is just a bunch of sequences separated by uh, some IDs specifying the ID and description of each of these uh, sequences. So the way to annotate that the new sequence begins is by this small arrow that you see here, this uh, greater than uh, symbol, and then followed by the ID and description of the sequence, and then on the next line, everything uh, that will appear in the following lines until the next uh, separator will be the sequence of this uh, description. And it will be just a sequence of letters in any alphabet. So in this case, you can see a protein alphabet. And it's important to also state that uh, all the white spaces will basically get ignored. So just to make it more readable. So very commonly, it will be like uh, truncated to, to small lines so it can fit into the screen. You can read it easily. Uh, but in reality, when you try to read this file, it will be just ignored and you will get everything as just one sequence with other white spaces in between. And by convention, at least that's how BioPython reads the file. Uh, the first word, so until the first space in the description line, will be considered the ID of the sequence. And the entire thing, including the ID, will be considered to be the description. Uh, that's what uh, BioPython will give you when you try to read it. Okay, any, any questions about the format? You mean this one? Yeah, it is. So th this is also another description. So all of that will be considered the ID up until this vertical line. And then you have a space. And all of that will be the description. And then you ha here you have the sequence. So in this example, you have a FASTA file with just two sequences. But it could go as long as you want, containing as many sequences as you'd like. Yeah. No, m most of the time there will not be empty lines, but like I said, white spaces and empty li and line breaks are just ignored. So, yeah. uh, no, I think it will be truncated away. Yeah, at least with BioPython, if you try to read it, it will just get rid of all the, the, the white spaces. Yeah. Uh, 
No, just a space. A space is like what, what indicates the end of, of the ID. Again, everything I say is, is in BioPython. I'm not sure how different parsers will parse it, but uh, I, I guess pretty similarly. Any more questions? OK, so let's talk a little bit about BioPython, first in the abstract. Uh, so like I said, a very common uh, Python library, I think the most common for uh, biologists. Uh, it really gives lots of capabilities, including working with sequences and annotations and many, many file formats. Okay, so we're going to cover just the tip of the iceberg of what this uh, package really allows you to do. If you want to read more about it, you can see I put you a link to its documentation. I recommend you to do it at least once just to very quickly uh, gloss over it and see like what it can offer you because there is a good chance that whatever it is that you mostly work on, uh, BioPython might have some useful capabilities that you could use uh, that could be really useful for you. Uh, today we're going to focus just on very uh, narrow uh, capabilities of, of, of the entire thing that BioPython really allows you. Uh, we're going to talk about a SecIO submodule of, of the BioPython module, which allows us to read and write uh, sequences in different formats. And so today we're going to uh, focus on the FASTA file, which I mentioned, and also the Genebike format, uh, which is the kind of, of annotation file that Michal showed you, uh, Michal showed you on the previous lesson. We're going to see an example of that too. Uh, but it really allows you to cover many other for, uh, formats. And again, you can read in, uh, the documentation and we'll cover a, a little bit more of those in the future. And we're also going to speak about the sec and the sec record objects, which represent sequences and, and uh, sequence records with annotations and allow us to uh, manipulate sequences. Uh, very much in the way of the kind of manipulations that we did uh, in previous lessons, we had to do that manually, like turning a DNA into RNA and translating and stuff like that. We can see that in BioPython, it's already built in. I've seen some other uh, small stuff. Uh, now, finally, it's important to mention that this uh, package is, in the end, really built by just uh, researchers, mostly, uh, like us. And it's maintained out of, out of the goodwill of, of people who develop and maintain it. And like most scientists, they depend on citations and credit to do uh, the incredible work that they do. So if you use BioPython in your work and you publish it, uh, you should uh, not forget to cite uh, this package. In fact, this applies to uh, most of the packages that are not built into Python and many of the packages we're going to learn in the future. So if you use them and if you see that they're useful for you, uh, just cite them, and this will allow them to continue to do what they do. And here I put you just a screenshot of, of uh, the documentation page, page of BioPython. And you can see really how detailed it is. So everything you want to learn about, any function, any class, any submodule, it has all the detailed information that you may want. So you can read about everything uh, and learn how to use it. OK, so let's see some code examples. So I opened the BioPython notebook that I put in the Moodle. Is it large enough? Can anybody see? Everybody see? Okay. So some general settings. And let's begin with an example of reading a FASTA file. So I put you in the Moodle uh, an example FASTA file. You can download it and we're now going to read it. Uh, so I already downloaded it. Uh, yeah, so let's open it with Notepad. This is in fact the same uh, sequence that they showed in the PowerPoint presentation. So you can see it has these two sequences with those descriptions and the protein sequences. So to load it using BioPython, we're going to import the SecIO submodule from the 
the bio module, which is uh, the, the name of the BioPython module. And then we're going to open this file like any other file using the open function. And then we will use the sekio parse function and we will give it the file handler that we created and specify the format that we want to read it with. In this case, it's a faster file, so we just write faster. And then what we get is an iterator. Uh, in fact, it's a lazy generator, so it will not read everything at once. Instead, it will each time read up until the uh, position of the next sequence. Then it will stop, will give you that uh, current sequence. And only when you go to the next iteration, it will give you the next sequence. So you shouldn't be afraid to use this, to this function on any file, no matter how big it is. Okay, because it will not read the entire thing, it will just give you one sequence at a time. Okay, so we iterate through the records, and then for each record we print its ID, its description, and the sequence itself. And of course, we do not forget to close the file. Okay, and you can indeed see, uh, like I showed you, you can see the ID and description of the first sequence, and then the sequence itself, and the same for the second sequence. Okay, you, you may, yeah, question. Um, um, we don't have the bio. Uh, yeah, maybe some of you open Jupyter. Um, I mean, there, there is a little bit of a mess here in the way they install the things. So I think there are two instances of, of Jupyter, and I think some of you might have opened uh, the wrong one. So you need to open the one that is with Anaconda. So the way you can be certain is you can search Anaconda here and then when you see this Anaconda prompt, you can uh, right click and see open file location. And then you'll get to the directory where Anaconda is installed and you'll see that it has this Jupyter notebook. So you need to open this Jupyter notebook, the one that is installed through Anaconda and not the other one, which is probably installed uh, through ju just default settings. Uh, I'm sorry about this mess, but this is how they install it. And uh, by the time we asked them to change it, they said it it's already too late. Uh, so, so if you open this one, <laughs> it should have all the, all the packages that we need installed. <coughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. So if, if you want to install it at home, uh, like you saw, that there was a bonus presentation about it, uh, mentioning Anaconda. Yeah, so once you install Anaconda, it's just like Conda install uh, BioPython. So installing packages through Anaconda is very simple. Uh, and it's built into the, the yeah, this Anaconda. Okay, so anyway, uh, you may wonder at this point, like what, what is this this record uh, object that you see here? So this is uh, this is a new type of object which is included in the BioPython. It's not a built-in type. And this is, by the way, a general tip. If you see some new object and you're not sure what it is and what it does, uh, to see what it gives you, you can use the uh, dot. And then if you hit the tab in an account, in IPython and many other uh, environments you will get like a list of all the things it can offer you. So you can see like all the things that it has. Like you can see it has an ID, it has a name, it has a sec, and you can just try different things and see what they do. Uh, if it's variables, you can try to print them. If it's a function, you can try to call them and see uh, what they do. Uh, but, yeah, but if you just print it, you can see that it has some sequence and it has some ID and it has some description. And if we look at records point sec, which here we store into the last sec variable, you can see that it has a type, which is again, uh, something that is included in the BioPython. So that it is a biosec uh, type. And like a string, you can ask uh, for its length and you see that it is, it is 284 uh, letters long. And you can even convert it to a string. If you prefer to work with uh, strings, you will get the same thing as a string instead of a sec object. 
Uh, there was a question? You will have to iterate through this generator that you get through SecIO parse. Okay, so in this example, we iterate basically through the entire file. In this case, it's just but two records long. Long, right? In On each iteration of the loop, you will get just one record. But throughout the entire loop, you will iterate through all the records. Okay? Okay, and, and by the way, here we call the SecIO parse, giving it a file handler object. Uh, but if you want, you can just give it a path of a file. And basically, if the first argument is a string rather than a file, it will know that what you mean is a file path. So it will open the file itself and also close it, and then you won't have to deal with opening and closing files. So we can just give it a path, and it will know to open it. And you can also use this, if you prefer to work, for example, with dictionaries, you can use the SecIO uh, to dict function, which will take this generator and create a dictionary where each record is mapped by its ID as a key. So we will basically have a mapping between the ID of a sec record to the sec record um, yeah, until here and, and then to the next one and so on. Um, so it may be more convenient if you want to if you want to look up records by their IDs, uh, but then you will lose the benefit of being memory efficient because once you turn it into a dictionary, it is no longer a generator; it is now a dictionary with everything loaded into memory. So it's not really passable if you work with uh, very big files. Sorry, you mean the sec record object? The first, the first line record. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, in fact, it doesn't save anything to memory other than just some metadata. So it knows which file it works on and it has some inner uh, variable which indicates like where it's currently reading from the file. But until you've actually tried it, started to iterate over it, it hasn't really read anything. So it, when you just called SecIO parse, it didn't really do anything. Just initialize, just initialize like, yeah, just. Yeah, when you call to dict, it will iterate through the entire thing and will turn it into a dictionary. If you use a for loop, it will just iterate uh, through each record at a time. Or if you use the next function. Yeah. So we yeah, if you work on a large file, it's very not recommended. If you work on a small file, you can use it. I mean, it can be sometimes more convenient. So if it's a small file and you feel comfortable loading everything to memory, then you can do it, yeah. More questions? Okay. So let's take a more in-depth look about the sec and the sec record objects. Uh, in fact, we do not need to read them from files. We can even create them ourselves if we want. So we can import the sec uh, type and also import an alphabet. And if we want to create a new sec object, we just need to provide the sequence as a string and initialize a new alphabet and we get a sec object, which we can uh, start working with. Now, you may wonder what's the point of this alphabet thing. Uh, in fact, what BioPython recommends to do is not using this generic alphabet, but providing a more specific alphabet. So for each uh, type of sequence, for example, for protein sequence, for DNA, for RNA, uh, it has its own kind of alphabet. And what BioPython wants you to do is to use the specific alphabet. <laughs> I can say that personally, I've never seen even one example of what it actually does. 
so you all, if you want to just be lazy and use an alphabet, that's not how BioPython recommends you to work with it. But as far as I can tell, uh, everything remains the same. So you do not really have to specify uh, the kind of alpha alphabet that you work with. Uh, although if you, was, you use a restricted alphabet, it can uh, keep you from making errors. So for example, if you provide a DNA alphabet and then you provide a nucleotide, a letter that is not really a nucleotide, you will get an error. Uh, whereas if you just work with any alphabet, uh, it, will know, it will not say anything to you. Uh, now, once we have constructed the sec object, we can work with it and it's very, very similar to strings. So pretty much most, most of the things that you can do with uh, strings, you can also do with the sec records. You can slice it very much like strings. You can multiply it with numbers. Uh, you can concatenate two sequ sequences together with a plus operator like a string. You can even count the occurrences of some substring and know that you do not even have to provide it a sec object. If you provide a string object, it knows to convert it into a sec and it works like you expect. Uh, same thing about the in uh, statement. You can ask whether some string is a subsequence of this sequence. And you can use the equal equal operator to compare it. And again, it can be a sequence object, it can be a string. It will work <coughs> like you expect it to work. And of course, you can convert it to a string. So like 90% of the stuff that work with strings also work with a sec object, uh, but there are mild differences, so, so do be careful of that. For example, if you want maybe to use the join function uh, that exists for strings, for the sec object it doesn't exist, so you will get an error that it doesn't really have an attribute join. Uh, but unlike strings, it will provide you some additional functionality that you can use, for example, you can use the transcribe function to turn a DNA sequence into an RNA sequence, okay? And you can also use the back transcribe to turn an RNA sequence into a DNA sequence. So in this case, you will get back the thing you started with. You can also use the translate function to translate it into protein, just taking uh, just dividing it to uh, triplets, uh, treating each uh, three letters as a codon and taking the, uh, the corresponding amino acid according to the standard codon table. And you will note that when you do that, it will not even treat stop codons in any special way. So if it sees a stop codon, it will just turn it into an asterisk and move on to the next uh, to the next amino acid. So it will not really stop at a stop colon. If you want it to stop, you will need to uh, do it yourself. And it doesn't matter if you use a translate on, on a DNA or on an RNA, so you can transcribe first and then translate, or you can translate the DNA right away. It will give you the same thing. You can also calculate the complement or the reverse complement of a DNA sequence. And you can chain these operations together. So for example, you can take the sequence, calculate its reverse complement, and then translate this sequence, and you will get some other amino acid sequence. Of course, if you try to do something which doesn't make sense, like translating a sequence and then trying to calculate the re reverse complement of that, uh, then BioPython will shout at you and say that proteins do not have complements. Uh, So that's about a sec object. Uh, there is also the sec record object, uh, which is basically just a sec, just a sequence with some annotations. At the very least, it should have an ID and a description. So to create a sec record, we first create a sequence. And then on top of that, we provide some ID and description. And we can turn all of that into a sec record. So here we create two sec record objects. And now if we want to save them into a FASTA file, we can do that. We open a file with the writing mode. And then instead of secio read, we use secio write. And we give the records, so some list of records. We give the file handler. And we say what format we want to store this information. In this case, a FASTA. Uh, we close the file. And then you can see that we will get uh, an appropriate FASTA file. So it will create this output FASTA. Let's see it. So here it is. 
And you can see I open it and I get what I expect. I get this ID and description and the sequence of each of these two sequences. Now, a very small thing that you should note is that there is some discrepancy between uh, the way that Sekai reads a FASTA file and how it writes it. So if you remember when it reads a FASTA file, then the ID will be a substring of the description. So the description will be the entire thing, and the ID will basically be the first word of the description. But you can see that when I write a file, it will put the ID, then put a space, and then put the description. So if I write a FASTA file and then read it using BioPython, the second time the description will be a bit longer. It will now have the ID as, as the beginning of the description. Uh, so th th it, it is a minor discrepancy, but it, it is something uh, to note. Any final questions? Yeah. Okay, so what happens if we now read it uh, using the SACIO module? Okay, we try to read this faster file. So, like I said, the entire line will be treated as the description. So the description of the first sequence will be everything, random sec one, a random sequence. All of that will be the description. But if you see here what the description was, uh, it was just what follows the ID. It wasn't, the ID wasn't included in the original description of this record. So now that I read it with BioPython, I will get a record that is not, doesn't perfectly match what I started with. Okay, so I, I don't think it's that much, that much of an issue, but it is something uh, to note.